Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Chanting Salawat Badar by M. Iqbal Mutakin And it goes singing the national anthem by Aura Zia Adinda All participants, please stand up and follow along. Allah, salamullah, 
ala taha rasulillah salatullah salamullah ala yasin habibillah ilahi salimil ghummah minal afati wan niqmah wa min hammi wa min ghummah bi ahlil badri ya allah Ilahi salimil ummah Minal afati wa niqmah Wa min hammin wa min ummah Bi ahlil badri ya Allah Salatullah salamullah على طه رسول الله صلاة الله سلام الله على ياسين حبيب الله صلاة الله سلام الله على yasin habibillah Participants, please have a seat. Excellencies, participants, ladies and gentlemen, this agenda is honorary chair speech by Dr. Ernita Dewi. The place is yours. Mak Medalan. Gosok, mudalan. Thanks to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala for His bless and mercy. Salawat and salam. May be upon the role model of all, of all of Muslim Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Yang saya hormati Bapa Wakil Rektor Win Araniri, Dr. Tunku Haji Gunawan Adnan, MA. 
yang saya hormati seluruh pimpinan FISIP dan seluruh karyawan, dosen, semua panitia yang telah menjalankan kegiatan ini dan semua yang telah berhadir baik partisipan secara luring maupun secara daring. Honorable, honorable to all invite speaker, Profesor Dr. Thomas Smith, Dr. Misbah Zulfa Elizabeth M. Hum, Katrina Liko, PhD, Dr. Benny Ridwan M. Hum. Ladies and gentlemen, women have important role in creating change in many aspects of life including in the social, political, and governmental field. Perempuan harus diberikan peluang yang besar untuk bisa ikut berkontribusi terlebih lagi di era digital sekarang ini. Peluang yang diberikan kepada perempuan bukan sekedar mengisi kekosongan atau hanya sebagai faktor mengikuti regulasi yang mengharuskan kehadirannya tetapi betul-betul harus diberikan karena perempuan memang layak dan mampu serta memiliki komitmen untuk ditempatkan pada posisi-posisi strategis. Membuat perempuan maju dan mengambil perannya mesti dilakukan dengan meninggalkan segala bentuk diskriminasi, sikap mengasihani, dan pandangan subordinat. Do position women as partner in work. This is important, particularly when we talk about women participation in the public sphere. Therefore, in this, this in this international conference, it is expect that all perspectives are being open even more, especially about what and how women sought at act in their role in the social and political political field. Selamat mengikuti konferensi ini. Semoga ini menjadi literasi tambahan untuk kita dan harapan saya dengan adanya International Conference ini kita dapat memperluas kembali bagaimana memandang perempuan dalam makna yang sesungguhnya dan konferensi ini akan memberikan kita sebuah pandangan baru bagaimana melihat perempuan di era 4.0 ini dan bagaimana perempuan di Aceh dan juga di Indonesia dan juga di dunia akan menjadi penentu arah kebijakan bangsa dan negara di masa mendatang. Terima kasih kepada Bapak Ibu Narasumber dan semua partisipan yang telah berhadir. Saya mengharapkan acara ini dapat berjalan dengan baik dan semuanya memiliki keilmuan yang baru dengan pertemuan ini. Kepada Allah kita berserah diri dan memohonkan supaya acara ini mendapatkan karunia dan rahmat dari Allah Subhanahu wa taala. Wabillahi taufik wa hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you to Mrs. Ernita Dewi for the honorary chair speech. Welcoming remark and keynote speech by Dr. Haji Gunawan Adenan MA. The place is yours.
وقال الله تعالى في القرآن الكريم هو صدق القائلين من عمل صالحا من ذكر العزى فنبي له حياة طيبة إلى آخر الآية صدق الله العظيم وقال صلى الله عليه وسلم في الشريف المرأة عماد البلاد فإذا صلحت سمت البلاد وإذا فسدت فسدت البلاد وقال أيضا في هذه الآخر الأم هي مدرسة الأولى شرق الله العظيم وشرق رسوله الكريم ونحن إن شاء الله على ذلك مشاهدين ومشاكلين All participants, especially the speakers, even the key speakers of today's seminar, I am very pleased to be here today to defer my opening speech on behalf of this international seminar that has been initiated by initiated by the faculty of uh, social and political sciences of national or state university is a mystery city or an equal object ladies and gentlemen bonjour guten morgen sabah al khair Selamat pagi. I would like to welcome you on this seminar. And this seminar is very strategic and very important today by addressing our highs and also deep praises to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that uh, who enables the seminar today is happen. And we would like also to address our salawat and salam to our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace be upon him, who is always a word to be our inspiration, our role model, because he had been sent, or we can say he has been sent by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala as the pattern and the most perfect example for us in which Rasulullah already mentioned in the Holy Quran that in the personality of Muhammad Sallallahu we can learn we can also uh, follow his behave, his akhlaq, and his everything, because he ever have already been chosen by Allah Subhanahu Taala as our role model. Lakat, I forget the 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 verse of the Quran that Allah mentioned. Uswatun Hasanah. Yeah. Muhammad is our Uswatun Hasana. Ladies and gentlemen, Islam is the perfect religion in especially in our uh, opinion as Muslim has already put women in a very special position. If when our Prophet Muhammad had already mentioned in this hadith or Muslim tradition, Al-Um Hiya Madrasatul Ula, the first and foremost school or school institutions in human life is our mother, I mean a woman. So if woman is living in very good way, good condition and good uh, education, good behavior as well, and the young generation will be 
framed will be shaped in a very good condition and very good akhlaq or character as well. Therefore, in the first statement of my speech on this seminar, I have mentioned Al-Mar'at wa Imadul Bilad. So, women, women are the pillar of a nation, of country. So if women are growing in very good condition and she's strong, strong. and the and nation the will be strong as well. But, but if women being uh, to say educated or play or also um, a lady in a bad condition, we has no good character. And the children and the generation to come will be in a good, will be in a strong. So we are looking for, or if we are wanting, or we should expect that a nation in Indonesia will be a good and strong country. First and foremost, we have to think and to put women in our situation to the nation. Especially the education, education women's role, women's role both, both in social in and social political, life political life should be, should be uh, uh, facilitated, facilitated, I mean well facilitated. I mean, well facilitated. Therefore, Therefore, Islam, Islam as the, the um, I mean, I mean very, very human religion and also very logical religion <laughs> should not should end. Not end and does not few and good women in a bad position. If we don't know what the revelation of the Quran is going to be more than this, this verse does not mean that a man will have, I mean, an automatic position as a leader, but a man should have many. Pre requirement such as we have a man can have a qualification to be a leader of in the family. For instance, they should be stronger than men, than women. They should have, I mean, power to protect women. They should have a financial capacity, I mean, to, to uh, financialize uh, his wife and children. If, he or they fail to do so, and the position to be a leader in family is not uh, automatically should be uh, given to men. Therefore, I would suggest and expect to all participants to take their serious consideration and attention for this uh, special I mean, uh, important component of today, so that after finishing this seminar, we can have, I mean, a good, um, how to say, um, opinion of yeah. and of you that women should be also given a positive and also strategic position to support national development and also women development, so that. Um, the collective goal of us, I mean, to uh, provide um, a sort of, I mean, a very health, a social health, I mean, in terms of social uh, life, should be, I mean, um, should be well supported by, by women, not, not also men, not only men. So, on behalf of the director of uh, the State University, Islamic State University of Raniri, I will officially, I would like officially open this conference uh, by also wishing Allah Riva and Allah support. And I would like to say Bismillahirrahmanirrahim and I open, I officially open this special and strategic seminar of today. Thank you very much for being with us today.
And I hope this component we produce will, how to say it, um, will be able to enhance women positions not only in social life but also in political life as well. Thank you very much for your support and your attending and your uh, uh, being with us. And my Allah, the, God, the Almighty God, um, protect us from any uh, unexpected things, especially about COVID-19. And we are expecting that this, the so-called town or this uh, pan pandemic, inshallah, will be demolished, will be, uh, how to say, raised by Allah SWT, so that we are going to be uh, living in safe and good and health condition. Um, last but not least, I, I would like to beg your pardon for any mistake or any unexpected uh, thing that uh, occur in my speech and by hoping Allah forgiveness uh, I will close this um, uh, speech by saying Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Waalaikum Thank you to Mr. Gunawan Adnan Next agenda is doa by M. Iqbal Murtakin the place is yours. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين حمد الناعمين حمد شاكرين حمد يوافي نعمه ويكافئ مزيده يا ربنا لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك الكريم وعظيم سلطانك اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آل سيدنا محمد اللهم أنت السلام ومنك السلام وإليك يعود السلام فهينا ربنا بالسلام وأدخلنا الجنة دار السلام تباركت ربنا وتعاليت يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم إنا نسألك رضاك والجنة ونعوذ بك من سخاتك والنار اللهم إنك عفو كريم تحب العفو فاعف عنا يا الله يا كريم اللهم إنك أنت السلام اللهم إنا نسألك رضاك والجنة ونعوذ بك من سخاتك والنار اللهم اللهم إنك عفو كريم تحب العفو فاعف عنا يا الله يا كريم آمين ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذريتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما وجعلنا للمتقين إماما ربنا هب لنا من أزواجنا وذريتنا قرة أعين وجعلنا للمتقين إماما ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار 
Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun Wa salamun ala al-mursaleen Walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen Before uh, continuing this, this seminar at the conference I would like to thank Prof. Dr. Thomas Smith Dankeschön für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit für dieses Seminar. Danke sehr. Und ich möchte auch zu danken Dr. Misbah Zulfa Elisabeth Empum, als auch als Katrina Liku, PhD, und Dr. Benny Ridwan Empum von Salatiga. Und We wish that this seminar will be successful. I mean, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. By the end of doa, it remains the end of opening section of the International Conference on Social and Political Affairs 2021. All in over this session to moderator Mrs. Melly Masni, MIR. Thank you for attention. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Excuse me, does anyone hear my voice clearly? Yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wa salatu wassalamu ala asyrofil anbiya'i wal mursalin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajmain. Amma ba'du. Bismillah Allah who has created this opportunity for all of us so we can gain health and strength so we can gather together in this forum in the International Conference on Social and Political Affairs 2021. Salam dan salam let us send to our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam his family and his companions honorable goes to The Vice of Rector of UIN Araniri, Dr. Haji Gunawan Adnan, MA. Um, honorable to the Dean of the Faculty of Social and Governmental Sciences, UIN Araniri, Dr. Ernita Dewi, SAG M. Hum. 
uh, honorable to all the vice of deans of the Faculty of Social and Governmental Sciences, UIN Araniri. And most importantly, honorable to all of our invited speakers, Professor Dr. Thomas Smith, GDMG Lecturer in Law at Universitas Gajah Mada. Thank you so much. The Dean of the Faculty of Social and Political Science at UIN Wali Songo. Thank you so much, Ibu Misbah. Um, the Associate Professor Katrina Liku, PhD, Lecturer in International Relations at Monash University. Thank you so much for participating with us, Miss. And Dr. Benny Ridwan M. Hum, the Dean of the Faculty of Ushuluddin, Adab and Humanity at EIN Salatiga. Thank you so much for participating, sir. So uh, I would like to say thank you to each and every one of you of, for being here with us today. We are also very pleased to be able to welcome those of you that have been with us through Zoom meeting as well. It is very good opportunity. Um, we are going to discuss a very important issue nowadays, which is in regards to the theme that we offer, which is enhancing women's roles in social and political life, new developments and trends. This issue is getting more particular attention because the roles women play apparently have been changed and different from what they used to be. Women used to be seen as police actors back then, where their roles were only around family and domestic environment. Today, we can see in many parts of the world, their broader roles are getting more recognition as important and highly crucial. As a consequence, women's equal rights and participation become significant to be pushed in the public agenda, the local level, national, as well as international level agenda. Therefore, today, our invited speakers who have their special expertise ranging from the field of law, humanity, international relations, as well as in the field of Islamic studies, are going to give their thoughts in regards to the theme above in this plenary session. The organization of this session will be first, the presentation by Professor Dr. Thomas Smith, Second, the presentation by Dr. Ms. Bahzulfa Elizabeth M. Hu, continued by presentation by Katrina Liku, PhD, and the last presentation will be delivered by Dr. Benny Ridwan M. Hu. Afterwards, the discussion session where every participant can post questions is opened and will be responded by the invited speakers. Last but not least, I will close this plenary session with a summary from our today's discussion. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's very clear enough for the organization of today's uh, plenary session. So for the first opportunity, I would like to welcome Professor Dr. Thomas Smith from Universitas Gajah Mada. Please allow me some time, sir, to reach uh, your resume. Professor Dr. Thomas Smith is the DAAD lecturer in law at Universitas Gajah Mada. He got his doctorate in law from Gottingen, had experiences of being a lecturer in several world universities, Federal University of Public Administration in Brill, Germany, Hanoi Law University, Vietnam, University of Cologne, Germany, University of Latvia, University of Gottingen, Germany, University of Bonn, Germany, and so forth. His areas of expertise are ranging from European law, constitutional law, administrative law, comparison of law in the field of public law, anti-legal terminology and multilingual communication of European and public laws. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Dr. Thomas Smith.
Okay, I start. To, huh? May I start my presentation now? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, I would like to share the screen if possible. Please allow me to share the screen. No. No, it's not yet working. <clears throat> Excuse me, sir. You need to share the screen? Yes, I need to share the screen. Please allow me to share the screen. Oh, okay. Do um, you have the problem with that? It has other other needs. Get the or ah, now, now, it, I, now it works, I think. Ah. Yes, now you yes. can see. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I think now you can see. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you can Selamat see. Siang. Yeah. Thank you very much for the invitation to give a lecture at this very interesting conference. I'm very sad that in the pandemic it's not possible to go to meet you physically in Vanda Arche, what I would have preferred. So I will give my lecture now from home in Yorkia. Also there, we cannot work at university at the moment. I hope you are all healthy and safe. And according with the experiences in Yorkia, I would really recommend to be careful, really careful in the next weeks. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much to allow me to give my lecture on approaches to promote gender parity in parliamentary representation in Germany and France. First of all, please download my materials, which I have uh, put online on my website. So when you click on that link here, uh, Thomas Neine Schmitz minus Jörg Jakarta, you can, uh, download the following material. I will show it now. This is uh, the handout for this conference. And in this material, you'll see some passages which are underlined. So if you download the PDF file, if you are interested, you can click on these passages which are underlined because there are links to further documents, political documents, uh, legal documents, uh, constitutions, laws, and so on, for all of you who are more interested in the topic. Well, ladies and gentlemen, men and women are equal, but most parliaments are strongly male-dominated, with the consequence that in the making of the laws, the male perspective prevails. In Europe, this has triggered in the 1990s a debate how to promote gender parity in democratic representation. <clears throat> On the parliamentary level, national and regional, in Germany we are now, we have a federal system, but also on the local level. I will represent approaches taken and discussed in Germany and in France. The European view on gender issues differs from that in Indonesia. Since women and men are equal, an aspect of human dignity, there is no reason for specific women's rights, except maternity protection. There are no women's rights in the European Human Rights Treaties, the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, the basic law for the Federal Republic of Germany, the German Constitution, or the Constitution of the French Republic of 1958. But instead, there is a firm commitment to non-discrimination and equal rights of men and women. While legal discrimination has been eliminated, Germany and other countries still have a lot of catching up to do 
to achieve effective gender equality in professional and political life. The public discussion focuses on this aspect, not on women's rights. The EU and its member states are committed to an active promotion of gender equality. The EU has passed far-reaching legislation on this purpose. Article 23 of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which anchors the right of equality between men and women at union level, insists that equality must be ensured in all areas and explicitly allows measures providing for scientific advantages in favor of the underrepresented sex. In Germany, Article 3, Section 2, Phrase 2 of the Basic Law, our Constitution, follows a similar approach requiring that the state shall promote the actual implementation of equal rights for women and men and work towards eliminating existing disadvantages. This goes beyond the prohibition of discrimination it establishes a positive obligation to equal rights and extends it to the social reality. It entitles the legislator to compensate for actually existing disadvantages. Thus, gender mainstreaming laws have introduced equal opportunity officers in the civil sector, which must be consulted in all gender related matters especially before personal decisions. Positions where women are underrepresented are filled by the practice to favor female applicants over equally qualified male applicants. In the private sector, a brand new federal law requires listed companies with more than three board members to appoint at least one woman to the board of the company. Measures to promote gender parity in the democratic representation would be well in line with this. The question is not if, but how to promote gender parity. May I ask you, can you all uh, understand me clearly? Yeah, I hope that's possible. Yeah. The French Constitution stipulates already in its first article that the law shall promote equal access by women and men to elective offices and posts, as well as to positions of professional and social responsibility. On this basis, in 2012, mandatory gender quotas for decision-making positions in the civil service were introduced. Unlike in Germany, the French constitutional mandate explicitly extends to the political sphere and is flanked by a constitutional obligation of the political parties to contribute to the implementation of this principle as provided for by statute under Article 4 of the Constitution. This makes it easier to overcome constitutional obstacles. Both provisions were introduced by constitutional amendment in 1999 and relocated and partially reformulated in 2008. France was one of the first countries in the world to take this path. However, <clears throat> despite this normative background, the parliaments are still male dominated. The female quota is present only 31% in the Deutsche Bundestag, the German national parliament, and even lower in almost half of the parliaments of the German lender. At the level of the local government, there is also much room for improvement, more in Germany than in France. In France, the female quota is around 40% in the National Assembly and 35% in the Senate. Why then? Well, why the aim to achieve gender parity in the parliamentary presentation is legitimate under the Constitution. It is difficult to achieve because 
various classical constitutional norms limit the range of means. First, the principle of freedom of political parties includes the freedom of election proposals. That means to nominate candidates <coughs> and propose candidate lists. Any interference with this freedom would be under high pressure of justification that could easily jeopardize democracy. This also applies to any criteria for the admission to it. Second, the principle of free election, an essential condition for any democratic election, requires that the will of the people will be formed by the people with the help of elections which are free from any influence of the state or its institutions. This applies already in the run up to the election and also includes the right of the political parties to freely nominate their candidates and propose lists. So, the principle of equal election, a special, strictly formal manifestation of the general principle of equality, requires equal conditions for the right to vote, but also for the right to stand as a candidate in election, the so-called passive vote. In particular, a man must have the same chance to become a candidate as a woman. Fourth, the principle of equal opportunities of political parties requires the state to treat all political parties equally, regardless of their policies or attitudes. This excludes any steering practice in providing facilities, grants, or other public benefits. Measures that promote gender equality must also not affect the equal opportunities of the parties politically. This, however, could happen if the specifications for the creation of candidate lists result, in fact, in the exclusion of important candidates. For example, if a requirement of equal gender representation forces a small feminist party to reserve important positions for men, or forces an explicit men's party to reserve them for women. Fifth, the German basic law guarantees equal rights of men and women and strictly prohibits differentiations by gender. It allows them only exceptionally if they're imperative, absolutely necessary, for the solution of problems which may by their nature arise only for men and women. That means usually only for biological reasons. Apart from this, any unequal treatment can only be legitimized by thorough balancing in the case of a serious collision with other constitutional values. It is questionable if a mere reference to the general, very general mission of the state to work towards eliminating existing disadvantages can be enough. Six, the principle of democracy does not generate bar measures to promote gender parity. True, all members of the parliament represent the entire people and thus, also the male members in the parliament represent the women. The parliament's composition does not need to reflect that of the population in its many diverse groups, like men and women, old and young, heterosex groups and LGBT, ethnic groups, and so on. However, this only allows the conclusion which has already been stated by the Federal Constitutional Court, that democracy does not require measures to promote gender parity, but it also does not exclude. Now I will present some classical examples. The most effective one are mandatory gender quotas as admission requirements for electoral lists if they are designed properly. For example, the mandatory 
alternate filling of positions in the zipper system. One man, one woman, one man, and one woman on the list, electoral list. Or equal gender ratio for groups of candidates on the list. Such mandatory gender quotas have been proposed again and again. All of them stand, however, for a state intervention into the free, free electoral process, which limits the freedom of the political parties and thus the free competition of ideas in the democracy. Therefore, this solution has raised significant constitutional concerns. In France, a law adopted in 1982 limited the allowed gender ratio on the electoral list for municipal councils of bigger communes to 70% to 25%. However, the Constitutional Council, the Conseil Constitutionnel, declared these provisions unconstitutional for violation of three articles on equality in the Constitution and the Declaration of the Rights of the Man and the Citizen of 1789, which is part of the French Constitutional Law. So these provisions could not enter into force. The Constitutional Council reasoned that these equality principles of constitutional value are opposed to any division of voters or eligible persons into categories like men and women. In 2000, that was different. On the basis of the new constitutional clause, clauses, which are now Article 1 and uh, 4, Section C, 2 of the Constitution, France adopted its famous parity law. This law amended the electoral code requiring gender-balanced electoral lists filled alternately by men and women in the zipping way for the regional parts of the senatorial and the European Parliament and lists with equal gender ratio for each group of six candidates for the municipal elections in bigger communities. This law has brought a significant progress. In 2019, after a controversial debate, the German landers Brandenburg and Thuringia amended without this constitutional basis, like in France, their land electoral laws to the effect that from now on, only gender balanced electoral lists following the zipping system, that means one man, one woman, one man, one woman, and so on, only these lists were admitted to the land parliamentary elections. In Thuringia, a list partially correct would be partially admitted until the position from which the requirements were not any longer met. Moreover, in exceptional cases, the list positions reserved for the women could be filled by men if there were not enough female candidates. In 2020, the Constitutional Court declared, in both lenders, they declared these laws void. The Thuringian Constitutional Court considered the right to free and equal elections under the Thuringian Constitution violated, as well as the right of political parties to freedom of activity and program and to equal opportunities. This is heavy, heavy criticism. The court reasoned that the parity rules would restrict the voters' freedom to influence the gender distribution in the parliament by electing a list on which only or predominantly men or women were listed. Moreover, the party members would no longer have the freedom to choose the candidates regardless of their gender and to apply for each list position themselves. The parties would be restricted in their freedom to underpin their program with a specifically gender-related composition of their electorates. They could also suffer disadvantages 
by not being able to list the person whom they deem most suitable. Furthermore, if a party whose list was partially rejected were to achieve fewer mandates as a result, then it would have been entitled to with regard to the votes for it, the practical effect of the votes for this party would be reduced and thus the equal practical effect of all votes in the democracy would not be any more guaranteed. Such interferences are not absolutely excluded, but must be constitutionally justified. Those affect in electoral equality, even by imperative constitutional reasons. The principle of democracy did not justify. Since it does not require the parliament's composition to mirror the composition of the people, but its party political preferences. Also, the late land's obligation under a mainstreaming clause in the Turingian constitution, which was even going further than though that in the law, and which may principally serve to justify certain measures that affect the freedom and equality of election, could not justify these encroachments because neither that norm's open and unclear wording nor its genesis allow the conclusion that this norm intends to justify such intense measures as rigid mandatory quotes. You see, these measures are considered as a very heavy encroachment on democracy. The Constitutional Court of Brandenburg considered the same rights and of the Brandenburg Constitution effective and also denied a constitutional justification. It emphasized that the parliament represents the people as a whole and not specifically its diverse groups, and that democracy and equal democratic participation of male and female do not require equal gender representation in the parliament. It also explained that from the gender mainstreaming clause in the Brandenburg Constitution, which corresponds to those in Thuringia and the basic law, no authority derives to amend the fundamental constitutional democratic structure principles by an ordinary law. A modification of these democratic principles would need a clear, specific regulation in the constitution itself. Well, now we come to a milder alternative. The approach of making public funding of political parties contingent on gender parity in the elections. This approach respects the freedom of the parties to choose their candidates. They still can choose freely, but it also creates an incentive for achieving more gender equality. In Europe and many countries, the political parties are partially financed by public benefits, by money paid by the state. And this could be made dependent on the degree of parity in the lists, the electoral lists. On the basis of the new clauses in the Constitution in France, the parity law of 2000 introduced the requirement of gender parity even for the majority election to the National Assembly. If in these elections, the numbers of male and female candidates of a political party differ by more than 2% of the public, uh, 2%, then the public financial support for that party will be reduced. Well, the effect of these rules in France was initially low. The parties accepted financial losses either, but continued to rely predominantly on male candidates. Or they used the dirty trick to nominate females in constituencies where they knew that they would not be successful anyway. So put the male candidates into those electoral districts where they may have a chance and put the women candidates in those districts where the party is in any way not powerful. Quite a problem. Only after a reform 
in 2014, which doubled the reduction, did the female quota in the French National Assembly increase. This experience shows that financial sanctions to enforce gender parity must be sensible to be effective. They must be tough. In Germany, this idea meets concerns with regard to the principle of equal opportunities for political parties, which re requires a strictly equal treatment of all parties and excludes any political steering practice. According to the predominating opinion in Germany, the French solution in Germany would require a special constitutional basis as it exists in France. But so far, it does not exist. Now we come to the third approach to promote gender parity, the voluntary self-commitment of the political parties. Three parties represented in the German Bundestag have anchored in their statute a binding self-commitment to gender parity in the electoral lists. The freedom of the political parties, understood in the light of the constitutional value to eliminate existing gender disparities, allows the parties to do so. However, the biggest bloc, the Christian Democrats, and two smaller parties have rejected this approach, which has caused the low female quota in the present Bundestag. And it is not expected that this quota will improve after the upcoming elections in September of this year. So this is not an effective way. Let me talk at the end about some flanking measures to encourage women's participation in politics. They are less discussed, but also important to achieve gender parity. First, campaigns to mobilize women. Cross-party networks of female politicians could support campaigns of public institutions and the civil society to invite women to become active and to inform them about the possibilities and conditions for being politically active. Retired female politicians could offer advice and coaching for newcomers. Such measures may not be so helpful uh, for the national or the land level, but they may be helpful to revive the often abandoned local politics. In local politics, the women could be more encouraged to become active by such men. Another aspect, which is particularly important for all kinds of gender equality questions in Germany, a better social infrastructure and more social consideration for the needs of members of parliament with young children could eliminate practical obstacles that often hinder German women from embarking on a political career. I am thinking of such measures as having own parliamentary daycare centers and kindergarten, or more tolerance towards breastfeeding mothers in plenary and committee meetings in the parliament, or daycare support in the hometown of the members of our parliament in order to allow the spouse to continue his own activities. Because often at the moment, if the woman in the family wants to work as a politician, that means that practically the man needs to give up his job. Because daycare of small children is a big problem. In them. We cannot have uh, employees in the household like in Indonesia, because it's impossible to pay. Now, a last bit. Last but not least, the resolute fight against misogynous cyberbullying, hate speech, and fake news in the social media and the internet. Misogynous attacks against women 
in the digital media have become more and more frequent in the recent years. Often they amount to a concrete threat, are orchestrated by unknown forces in campaign, and specifically targeted against politically active women in order to intimidate them. Without a vigorous prevention and criminal prosecution of these offenses in the internet, which are intimidating women, the idea of equal political participation of women will remain an illusion. So, my conclusion will be, while mandatory gender quota interferes seriously with a free democratic process and are very controversial among the constitutionalists, the milder approach of linking the public party funding, that means of political parties by the state, and linking it to gender parity, this approach respects the party's freedom, but also creates pressure towards more gender parity. If the difference in public funding of political parties, depending on the female quota on their list, is sensible, is tough. However, this solution also requires a specific constitutional basis, which needs to be created by constitutional amendment. I think it would be the same in Indonesia. And constitutional amendment, in turn, presupposes a broad consensus in the society. On the other hand, voluntary self commitments of the parties are not suitable. The role of flanking measures to encourage women's participation in politics should not be underestimated. The state must in particular fight misogynist cyberbullying, hate speech and fake news in the digital media. Phenomena which are already discouraging many women worldwide and also in France and Germany from becoming or staying politically active. So there's still a long way to go. France is already more advanced. I thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to your questions and the discussion. Prima Kasi. Okay. okay, thank you so much uh, for a very intensive discussion about um, European perspective on gender parity. I got the uniqueness of European perspective in here. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, sir. Um, I found that you said that European, in European perspective, there is no need to create specific rights for women because women is equal with men, so there is no need to make a specific or special rights for them, right? That, that is in correct. Terms of modern, uh, in terms of maternity rights. So um, what you offer is to propose campaigns to encourage more women to participate, not to create a special rights for them, and also to give more considerations for the needs of members of parliament with children, as well as resolute, resolute fight against cyberbullying, hate speech, so women can have more confidence and courage to stand in the political or public sphere. Okay, thank you so much for the perspective, sir. For the next opportunity, I would like to welcome Dr. Uh, Ms. Bahzulfa Elizabeth M. Hu to uh, <laughs> give her perspective in regards to the theme that we offer. Before that, I'm going to read um, Dr. Ms. Bahzulfa Elizabeth C.P. So, Dr. Ms. Bahzulfa Elizabeth M. Hu is the Dean of the Faculty of Social and Political Sciences. Yeah. 
and in Walisong of Marang. She graduated her undergraduate master as well as PhD program from the Department of Anthropology, Gajah Mada University. She got many short courses in countries like US, Dutch, Australia, and Romania on the program on conflict resolution and mediation, gender study, academic writing, and journal management. She is the editor in chief of journal Sociology Wali Songo or GSW. She published her articles both in national and international reputable journal. Her newest publication is Dynamics in Attaining Women Quota of 30% Study Among Political Parties in Central Java Province, Indonesia, published in the proceeding of the first international conference on law, social science, economics, and education. So, ladies and gentlemen, Please welcome Dr. Ms. Bahzul Pa Elizabeth. The first is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the moderator, Mbak Melly, for the time. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, the Excellency, the Vice Rector One for UIN Aramidi, uh, Bapak uh, Dr. Haji Muhammad Adnan, MA, and uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Political and uh, Governance Administration. Ibu uh, uh, Elin, yeah. And then all the speaker in this uh, conference. Um, it's a very nice time to hear with you all and uh, to discuss everything related to uh, the effort to enhancing the participation of women in a public sphere. What I want to underline in this discussion is related to how women support women. Uh, may I share the PPT for the uh, objection of this discussion? Yeah. Okay. Uh, did you find the PPT, Mbak Melly? I can see. Yeah. Uh, this, there is a feedback from your sound. Yeah. Uh, okay, this, this is uh, the theme of my uh, of my theme in this discussion is women support women. Factually, is it not uh, women factually support women? But I this is my concern. Uh, how uh, women uh, show their their attitude and their uh, also their. Uh, uh, agenda in their political uh, activities in order to support uh, the other college of women and uh, respond uh, in the context of women candidacy and i want to underline two sample of uh, central java uh, regional election i want to take one woman who are uh, who is uh, elected in twice and one woman other uh, who fell in the uh, regional election. Yeah. Why I un uh, underline this uh, theme? Uh, because, yeah, uh, really this, this study is not related to women really support women, but uh, women uh, have a lack support to other women factually. So it is interesting to study this, uh, the, the, this theme because we need to support women in other, uh, to support other women because uh, some reason. Yeah, uh, we know that, uh, okay, let me uh, find out the, The next, yeah. What is the background of this study? Uh, the first is that uh, Indonesia. Uh, it is it is different to Europe, of course, uh, because uh, we have a phenomenon of uh, gender in our society. Uh, in that context, a woman is subordinate. Of, of course, in all of uh, life sphere, including politics, of course. 
uh, this different to Europe. Uh, so we need the affirmative action and Indonesia still since uh, 2002 uh, enacted the regulation to support women uh, involvement of women in the politics and the enactment stated the quota of 30 percent uh, for the involvement of women in the politics uh, also uh, the the enactment of the regulation still seen by some is uh, lip, lip, uh, lip, lip service only because there is no factual effort uh, to support women. But yeah, it is not bad uh, because uh, it is better than no, no nothing. So uh, this is the effort in Indonesia and uh, we have, we, we, we have re renewed the regulation in 2016 to make the enactment is more clear. Yeah, this is the first, the background. Uh, so uh, based on the uh, regulation, factually, Indonesia try to support women. Yeah, that, that, and this is uh, rational because uh, Indonesia is one of the country uh, signing the international uh, convention so we must support the gender equality in uh, in all of our regulation and the uh, and the next uh, theme that we, we need to underline is that after the enactment of the regulation what about the participation of women in the politics uh, Actually, there is a little bit increasing number, uh, for example, in the legislative, uh, but uh, last year it become decreased. Uh, this year, a little bit higher, but I want to underline the, uh, the participation of women in, as, the, uh, as the leader of uh, a region, as a region or as a major. What, what I mean here. And, uh, and the other point is that factually there, is a, there, there are some program of dissemination uh, among the women organization, for example, uh, who support, who have the program for supporting women in uh, public sphere. But factually the program uh, which is uh, supported by some donor, for example, uh, from uh, from the uh, UN, for example, or the Ministry of Women and uh, uh, what is it, uh, uh, family planning, for example. This is a stay only a program. There is no uh, deeply influence in the mind of the woman. So after the election held, the woman still on the concept, a uh, traditional concept. What is the concept? Uh, we, 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 will, we will know later, yeah. And uh, seeing to the uh, study related to woman, actually there are so many study uh, that we can find in the journal. Uh, and the focus usually on the ver uh, how the uh, country do the affirmative action and then how women have the strategy to attend the quota, uh, both women or uh, country, and then how women uh, involved in the uh, public, public sphere. Yeah, and the, and the study here, underline to the how women usually in a descriptive role they are in the legislative on as the leader of the uh, party for example but they are still in the concept of uh, only fulfill the requirement they are not uh, take the role as the legislator or as the leader of the uh, 
organization. Uh, so uh, based on uh, this uh, concept, I underline this uh, study. Yeah. Uh, this is different to the uh, uh, professor who uh, who focus in Europe. It is very local, but it is uh, inter in interesting for me uh, because this is the real fact of women participation. Yeah. Uh, one of the uh, sample, not not sample, but representative of uh, under yeah outstanding women. Yeah, uh, who are who is very good as the uh, candidate of uh, region. The both of them, but they have different uh, uh, different jetty. Yeah, the one uh, the one candidate who is uh, fell is the candidate in the in Pakalongan Regency. Uh, she is a strong woman as the leader of, as the head of uh, legislative of the region, uh, having the name of Balkis Diab. Yeah. And uh, really he is a politician. And, uh, I think there is no one thing that he will fail in the in the in the uh, candidacy because at the first step of the candidacy, all the uh, party nine party in the region uh, only two uh, didn't support her. But in the last step of the candidacy, so there is a move of the coalition. This is an in, uh, interesting thing. So uh, the the map become change, and the other uh, profile that I under underline is Ibu Sri Sumarmi is a region in Grobogan, and he get uh, the the position in the second time. The first position is. Uh, from 2016 to 2021. And this is interesting because after the inauguration of his position as the region, the vice region uh, failed to, 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 uh, to be inaugurated because of pass away. And till the end of his uh, region, uh, she super me only take the position only with him herself without any vice region this is very interesting so we we we, we can see her as a very strong woman yeah to had a position in one uh, re re region time only by herself and 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 uh, she is elected re-elected in the second time no, I want to underline more uh, about uh, the reality. Yeah. So after uh, mapping out what the background of this study, I, I asked some question. Uh, and I focus my study on the women activists in some of uh, both uh, religion and non-religion organization uh, and I choose uh, some informant they are uh, the leader of the organization and uh, we try to uh, ask for the the, uh, the question related to their uh, footing uh, by some way as uh, uh, interview and uh, deep interview and also observation and uh, focus group discussion. And what we asked about to whom they food and what was the reason they choose the candidate, candidate and how they try to win the candidate if they had, it is very interesting. And 
uh, what they say about their uh, to whom uh, uh, they give the, their ballot is not always for women. So our assumption that uh, demographically women win, but not the the food. So many reasons they gave. Uh, factually, they said that. Uh, yeah, uh, we don't we don't choose women because, and the reason is like this. Yeah. So, yeah. So many reasons actually that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we know that uh, especially in the religious group organization, some uh, religious group, religious woman group organization affiliate to some political party. So they, they have no uh, independent view about the food they want to give for. So that is why they, they are dependent, de dependent on the party they affiliate on. This is uh, one of the uh, data that we got. So we, we see here that although the woman is activist, but they still co-opted by uh, deficient about the uh, part, political party they affiliate with. And then uh, they also consider uh, the candidate from what group, uh, from what religious group. They consider that. And something interesting is that also they try to, to give the food with those who are having the common ethnic group, quote and quote. What I, I say here, what, uh, why I say here, because in the Pekalongan, for example, it's a very, very outstanding candidate. But she is uh, ethnically not fully Japanese. That is why the opposite, the opposite of the candidate always uh, uh, blow up the ethnic sensitivity. So we see here uh, gender underlined by other uh, social process. And then uh, genealogy, uh, who is the candidate? Uh, is he uh, uh, has uh, some relation uh, with us and other things. And the other is their feeling for not fitting to choose another candidate. This is very, uh, very gender bias. And if they say this, so factually they prefer men than women. So uh, based on this result, yeah. Uh, they, they also try to, especially to, for those who have the candidate uh, for the uh, candidacy, they try to make a strategy, yeah, make a strategy in, in order, uh, yeah, uh, in order to win the, the candidate. Yeah, yeah each of the uh, uh, question have the implication to the strategy that uh, they have. Yeah. And especially for those who have the ac activity in many surrounding, for example, organization, et, uh, etc., the, uh, they, they usually have the strategic effort uh, in order to win the, their candidate. That is uh, uh, the point. And and for those who uh, have not enough surrounding to uh, disseminate their uh, strategy, they, they only uh, spread the, for example, uh, the image about the woman. This is very gender. Uh, woman to woman uh, with a small talk and then talk about the uh, minor point of the candidacy and et cetera in order to, uh, uh, fail the woman. This is uh, this is the the 
the data. And some other only follow the trend in the society. But, but many of them uh, don't take it seriously or uh, take the indifference attitude about the, uh, about the candidacy. Uh, they don't want to think about uh, whether the candidate woman or, ma or man, they don't think about that. Uh, I think uh, this is uh, only, uh, it is also the point, how women have the attitude about uh, the supporting program for women in uh, public spell. Uh, what we uh, can uh, discuss about the fact, the fact and data. Uh, I underline that gender factually uh, not always have the strong ties and become the strong bond in one entity of gender. Because in the context of politics, uh, woman is very blur in, in in choosing woman. Yeah, gender consideration all always related to other uh, societal process, uh, to ethnic group and then to religion and then to uh, basic organization. The the all of big surrounding then woman is very gender biased. So women here follow the gender bias wave. They don't have any uh, strength to resist the gender, uh, the gender bias wave. So that is why uh, gender context is so strong. Yeah. So, uh, because of this map, so gender inequality is not only found in the big context, but also in the mind of the woman. So that is the, 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 the thing that we must think about. So based on this uh, analysis, what I have the comment here is that, uh, gender knowledge must become the basic point in changing the concept of equality. This is the, the core of the uh, cultural change. And the gender equality knowledge must be disseminated or enculturated in the context of the smallest entity in our society, it is family. If we have the father and mother having the concept of gender equality, there is the uh, important time to enculturate children to have the equal role in the society. Both women and men may become, uh, have the very important role in the society if they have the uh, enough knowledge, enough uh, capability in uh, applying any role in the society, not only men. And this is the, po the important point. So uh, I think it did many generations to change the concept of traditional gender that, uh, that disseminate now to what the gender, to what uh, uh, equal gender relation because this is a point of culture. So there is, there is important, so uh, there will be not important to be a change in instantly. It needs many generations. That is uh, all that I may state in this uh, session, um, but mainly as moderator, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, thank you so much, uh, Ibu Misbah, for the uh, for the presentation. Um, actually, you give us um, how to say the portrait of 
um, women's participations in politics, actually not only in Java, but also in Aceh. Actually, that what happened today uh, in politics. And what you are suggesting in this forum is for women to support others women who compete in the general election or etc. So, um, Ibu Miss Bazova Elizabeth gives the, the portrait of how actually, even though there is like um, gender mandatory requirement in, uh, for women to participate in politics, like 30% of quota for women, in fact, it is still far from uh, perfect. Whereas it is not supposed to be a problem if you look at the demographic figures. But apparently, because women do not support others' women, that becomes a problem, I think. And also, um, actually, some measures have been taken by the Indonesian government, as well as in international level by the UN, United Nations, um, to promote women's participation in politics, but still, it's, it's still not achieved. And based on the research that Ibu Misbah uh, did before, actually not all women who participated in general elections voted for women as well. They voted based on affiliated political uh, parties, for example, religious groups, ethnic groups, even genealogy, genealogy, not based on the candidate's ability, not based on whether it's women or women, because still people are not aware about the uh, gender uh, differences. So the strategies that have been uh, proposed by Ibu Misbah is to uh, give information about gender knowledge, to make people aware of gender, and gender equality must be incultural, enculturated in family. How to uh, give uh, understanding for uh, both men and women since their very early age about um, equal roles of women and men in social and even in political life. I think that is the summary. Thank you so much, Ibu Misbah, for a very intensive uh, presentation. Thank so, you. Uh, for the next opportunity, I would like to invite Ms. Katrina Liku, PhD, for giving her presentation in this very good opportunity. So I would like to uh, read the summary of her CV first. <laughs> Ms. Katrina Liku, are you with us? Yes, I am. Hi, Melly. <laughs> okay. Katrina Liku is an associate professor in international relations at Monash University. She graduated her undergraduate degree in history of government from the University of Queensland, her master degree in politics from the University of Nottingham, and her doctoral in political science and international relations from Australia National University. She worked as a deputy director in Monash Gender Peace and Security Program at Monash University from 2015 to 2020. As a trained politics and international relations scholar with a focus upon security studies, feminist, international relations and women's political participation and leadership, her areas of research expertise intersect women's leadership, peace and conflict, and global policy. Her latest contribution is a book entitled Gender Politics, Navigating Political Leadership in Australia, published in 2021. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Ms. Katrina Liku. Thank you very much and Salamat Pagi. Uh, thank you to Melly and the organizers for the inv invitation to speak with you today. Uh, and I acknowledge the Vice Rector and the Dean and thank them for their warm welcome this morning. So I look forward to our discussions and welcome any feedback that you might have for me on this research that I've been doing. So my research examines the impact that women's participation and involvement in formal peace processes and peace agreements can have on women's rights after conflict. 
Globally, the evidence shows that women's formal participation in peace processes brings a positive oh. for the peace process itself and for the post-conflict society. Research shows uh, that where women are involved in the process of negotiating peace agreements, the agreements themselves are firstly more likely to be signed, uh, secondly, more likely to include issues in the peace agreement that are relative to women and women's post-conflict recovery, and thirdly and importantly, the peace agreements are more likely to last longer. So research shows that societies can maintain higher, or societies that do maintain higher levels of gender equality are more likely to experience peace and they're less likely uh, to have internal strife and to have conflict. So in short, uh, globally, the research is showing that when men and women are included in formal processes of peace building and of moving societies towards peace, that peace is more likely to be inclusive, to be successful and to last longer. But uh, as some of our spoke, uh, speakers um, have already sort of noted, um, women's involvement in peace processes and in politics more generally is still the exception rather than the rule. So as we watch the current negotiations at the moment between the Taliban and the government of Afghanistan, we can see only really limited involvement of women who are uh, only on the government's side um, and limited consideration of the issues that are affecting women uh, throughout the conflict and that will affect them um, as Afghanistan tries to find some kind of peace. In fact, UN Women have reported that between 1992 and 2019, uh, only 13% of peace negotiators have been women. And research that's been done by my own team at Monash University's Gender, Peace and Security Centre has found that between 2000 and 2016, only about half of the peace agreements that have been negotiated have had details or provisions in them that try to protect women's rights. And where these provisions exist, they are actually quite weak in the ways in which they're phrased, and there is generally very low implementation of these agreements. And this is despite the fact, as, uh, as Nellie and some of our other speakers were noting, um, that there are international frameworks to support women's participation. So last year, we celebrated 20 years since the United Nations Security Council adopted um, Security Council Resolution 1325. And as most of you know, this resolution and its 10 subsequent resolutions constitute the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. And that agenda advocates for women's full, equal and meaningful participation in all aspects of the peace process. And so some, some 98 countries have committed to implementing this agenda, which includes Australia and Indonesia, through the development of national action plans. But nonetheless, as the statistics show, the implementation remains quite weak. So what does this global picture look like for Arche in the 15 years since the signing of the 2005 Memorandum of Understanding? In this paper, I'd like to explore the relationship between women's participation in that formal peace process and some of the current challenges that women are facing in Arche today. And I welcome any thoughts um, and advice on the research. So the research draws from uh, the work of a number of Indonesian scholars, uh, but also from field work that I conducted before the pandemic um, in 2018 and 2019. So I, I undertook interviews in Jakarta with civil society actors, researchers and government officials and worked with a research team in Arche to undertake some interviews and focus group discussions with some local officials, some women's NGOs, um, former female combatants and members of the local community. So my main finding from the research was that while Archinese women continue to have an important social and cultural presence within their communities, they have been largely excluded from the formal aspects of power. This is in part, uh, but not wholly explained by, but it is in part a legacy of their exclusion from the peace process. 
And this finding uh, sits along research by other observers, including Sharia Mahaban, who argued earlier this year that peace agreements cannot only be about ending violence. They have to be about shaping a vision to rebuild a community, a community's economy, its governance structure, the political participation of its citizens, and to acknowledge issues, including human rights and gender justice. So I would argue that the exclusion of women uh, from the formal peace process in Arche undermined this goal and the opportunity that there was to create this kind of inclusive post-conflict society. So overall, based on the interviews I did, I traced several issues uh, that have shaped women's exclusion from post-conflict participation in Arche. Uh, firstly, there continues to be a social and religious conservatism among both men and women that does not see women as natural leaders in the political or public space. Um, as, Dr, as Dr Elizabeth was saying, uh, there is also the issue that women don't tend necessarily to always support women. Second, I found that there was a kind of ongoing masculinism that sees political and high level roles as kind of sites of competition and sites that are quite combative, where women are not always welcome or don't think that they are able to compete. Thirdly, I found that there, where there are frameworks to support women's formal participation, such as the 30% quota, that it's rarely implemented uh, in Arche or the approaches that are taken to the implementation lack a kind of strong political commitment. I also found, particularly speaking with women civil society actors, that there was a general kind of surveillance or watching of women in public space by other members of the community. Some of the women I spoke to had experienced threats and some advocates argued that they felt uncomfortable or unsafe in advocating for women's issues within the community. In some ways, of course, this disappointing out, this is a very disappointing outcome given women's history of leadership in Arche and of course their involvement in the history of peace building uh, in the province. And as most of you will know, women were the first to organise for peace in Arche in the most recent conflict. In February 2000, the All Archonese Women's Congress of Duek uh, Pakat Ingong Arche organised 437 women from across the province to meet in sometimes quite dangerous circumstances and to discuss the prospects of peace. Uh, the Duek Pakat spoke of the need for non-violent resolution for the conflict, and they were the first kind of forum to do so, and they advocated for the ongoing role that women should play in decision-making as Arche sought to move out of conflict. But when it came to the formal negotiations for peace in 2005, which was hosted, of course, um, in Europe uh, and mediated by the former president of uh, Finland, uh, women were largely absent from the formal negotiations. So too were gender issues or issues which yeah. particularly affected women. So the Memorandum of Understanding, which covered issues... <laughs> Post-conflict governance, um, disarmament, demobilisation and reintegration, or DDR, truth and justice issues, and issues around resource sharing, all of these issues ignored the ways in which um, these issues particularly affected women, but also the unique ways in which women had experienced the conflict. And this had an impact of kind of marginalising their concerns and their voices in the formal efforts to find peace and create a post-conflict society were largely mute. So in this sense, women didn't receive any of the so-called peace dividends. These were the spoils of war that were largely given to men uh, and mostly men who had held positions of power or authority during the conflict. So the exclusion of women and women's issues from the peace process marks a kind of important turning point that encouraged women's exclusion from the formal structures of political power in post-conflict era. And to look at the ways in which this played out, um, research suggests that uh, for example, in terms of the DDR program, the reintegration program that was implemented by the Arche monitoring mission, uh, the Ingong Bali were not recognised as fighters. Uh, 
And as far as I can see, the women were not eligible for any funding or resources that went to ex-fighters. So in some of the focus group discussions I conducted, uh, one of the former fighters said to me, female fighters said to me, no women here received any money. And our recognition of our, or recognition for our efforts in the conflict, but we were there, we were fighting alongside men. Similarly, other respondents talked about the ways in which that impact, impacted them in two ways. Firstly, was about the access to the resources and programs that were part of um, the reintegration process. These were set aside only for former male, male former militants. But secondly, a number of women spoke to me about the ways in which it denied the kind of social benefits that came with being acknowledged as a former fighter. This included perhaps respect and esteem within the society uh, and legitimacy as a public figure or a leader within the community. Um, I think uh, um, uh, Dr. Elizabeth has spoken quite a lot about political representation, but of course the issue of governance was another key area of the MOU agreement. Um, and here my interviewees showed mixed views. When I asked them about women's political representation, many of them said that there were no, bar no formal barriers that stopped women's participation. Instead, they focused on the fact that there was indeed the 30% quota for women candidates that was operating both at the national and provincial level. This law, as, as Dr Elizabeth has nicely outlined for us, requires every political party to register 30% women in their candidacy lists and in their political leadership structures. However, in my interviews in Arche, I found very few uh, local official, officials who felt that they were bound by that regulation. Uh, very few of them felt that they needed to implement it. And where it was implemented, there seemed to me to be a lot of insincere behaviour around it. So in some cases, we saw people, women being registered who were female members of other candidates' families or the female relatives of the party elite. Initially, some women were registered with their names right at the bottom of the candidates list, which meant that they were very unlikely to be elected, although a law was passed in 2009 to change this. And according to research by Asna Husin, uh, published last year, she said that when we look at the representation of women uh, at both Arche's provincial and district levels, what we can see is that women constitute 11% of representatives, which of course is far below the 30%. And in my interviews, I found seven reasons, several reasons for the failure um, to hit this target. Uh, civil society organisations that I spoke to talked about the high cost of standing for election and how that was sometimes outside of women's abilities to pay for. They talked about the role of elite political networks, which usually sought to sideline genuine women candidates. They talked about the lack of broad support that women candidates had from their families and their communities. And sometimes, as Dr. Elizabeth pointed to, the lack of support they had from other women. In some cases, women reported experiencing hostile attitudes uh, towards their candidature. Some, some civil society groups spoke about the lack of um, oh, sorry, some women candidates spoke about the lack of support they'd received in terms of training or preparing them for the election or educating them on how to run for the election, although other candidates I'd spoken to had received support from civil society organisations. But I also found that there was an unwillingness of political parties to choose genuine women candidates and instead chose candidates that they felt they could more easily control. Um, but also that there was a lack of support sometimes uh, from the party for their female candidates. Uh, I think to some extent this research aligns with the findings um, of Dr. Um, Ms. Ba Azulfa Elizabeth and her research in Central Java uh, published last year, which similarly found that political elitism is a major barrier to women's participation. Uh, so research again by um, Asna Husson. Um, suggests that women are also equally underrepresented, not just in, in, uh, um, in parliament and in political roles, 
but also in other important areas of decision making, uh, particularly those that, that have um, issues to do with resource distribution and community leadership. So this includes, for instance, women's participation in the police force, in academic institutions and schools, in large businesses and companies, in, as large scale entrepreneurs in social organisation. Research is suggesting that young women in Arche particularly are increasingly expressing a desire to enter areas such as the civil service um, and bring with them the benefits of higher education. But what some of the research suggests is that these aren't yet in leadership roles. So my interviewees are again saying that there's no formal obstacle to women's participation, but there remains social, cultural and structural issues. Uh, which can impede women's ability to secure high profile leadership roles within the community. Finally, I'll just very quickly touch on the Arche Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and I welcome any um, further advice or knowledge about this. Um, it held, as far as I'm aware, its first hearings in November 2018 and then in July 2019. But my understanding is that to date, there's been no support provided to women victims of the conflict or sustained engagement with the unique ways in which women experience the conflict. I think as is well known, the Commission itself has been hampered with a number of issues, including the lack of funding and support from the central government, but it does mean that it remains to be unclear, at least to me, um, whether support for women through this process will be forthcoming. So I've talked about three areas. Um, of the peace agreement that were core areas, the process of reintegration, the process of political representation and governments, governance, and very briefly, the issue of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, in all three cases, we can see the ways in which um, women's exclusion has led to their ongoing uh, exclusion um, some 15 years later. So globally, the research, as I said in the introduction, is showing that where women civil society and women leaders are able to influence the formal peace processes, we're seeing stronger peace agreements and peace agreements that have stronger considerations of gender issues. This creates a foundation for women's ongoing participation in the community after the conflict. However, the peace process in Arche, like many others around the world, and like we're perhaps seeing in Afghanistan at the moment, uh, has seen the opposite. The peace process did not have the strong presence of women, and the peace agreement was largely gender blind. In the following years, uh, the agreement, in the years, sorry, following the agreement, the chief negotiator, the former president of Finland, has acknowledged this, and he demonstrated regret, saying that it would have been better to include both greater representation from women and from civil society. But this failure, I argue, has had a lasting impact upon the capacity of women to access formal political power and leadership in the 15 years since the end of the conflict. This, of course, is not the only issue that we need to consider, but it has allowed the absence of women from formal power uh, to become both normal and entrenched in some ways uh, in contemporary Arche. And as Dr. Elizabeth was saying, uh, there needs to be uh, a new kind of, of cultural and attitudinal change. Uh, and that of course will take time because the way forward is to support women and men to understand the role that women can play in the development of the nation. I think the vice rector um, in his opening address described women as the pillar of the nation and that they should be given the position to support national development and political life. So I think this is where the future lies. And I'll leave my comments there. Uh, thank you very much, Tara Makassi. Thank you so much, Ms. Katrina, for a very intensive uh, uh, discussion about women's roles in peace and conflict resolution. Um, she gives some portraits of uh, Achenese women uh, in terms of decision-making process, in terms of society as well, as well as in the conflict and peace uh, resolution. So still, um, um, based on her research, women are still excluded 
from the discussions of power or decision making. Um, also, it's based on the interview with the local society, it's still uncomfortable apparently to talk about women issues in Aceh. And also, um, even though there is like a 30% quota per woman, actually it's still not achieved yet. Even though there is no formal barriers for women's participation in politics, but apparently it's social and cultural issues that impede them from having their willingness to join in uh, politics, uh, either because of its high cost and they themselves cannot afford to pay for the high cost that they should pay for the for joining in the uh, politics area. So thank you so much for the discussion, Ms. Katrina. And last but not least, um, the presentation will be delivered by Dr. Benny Ridwan and M. Hum. Um, please let me to uh, read the short resume of Dr. Benny Ridwan M. Hu. He is the Dean of the Faculty of Usuluddin, Adab and Humanity at IAN Salatiga. He graduated his undergraduate degree in philosophical faith from IAN Walisongo, his master degree in philosophy from the Universitas Gajah Mada, and his doctoral in Islamic studies from UIN Sunan Kalijaga, Yogyakarta. He was the recipient of an honorary award from the President of the Republic of Indonesia, Satya Lanchana Karya Satya, for twice. He is currently the Editor-in-Chief in Milati, Journal of Islamic Studies and Humanities, one of our journal partners in this international conference. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Benny Ridwan M. Hum. Okay, thank you, Mel. Thank you, Mel. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hamdan wa subhanallah. Summa salatan wa salaman la ilaha illallah rasulillah. Benny, there is a feedback sound. Yeah. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, especially uh, all participant, all speaker, uh, Professor Thomas, uh, Dr. Ms. Bazulfa, my uh, senior colleague in Win Walisongo Semarang, uh, Katrina Niku, PhD. Today we are going to discuss about uh, women and politics. I would like to tell you about uh, women political participation. Uh, the first time I will start about outline my presentation from a philosophical argument. And the second one, uh, we discuss about political participation, and the third, politic and achievement, and the fourth, Indonesian woman in parliament, and the last one, uh, the fundamental challenges of the women's movement ahead. Okay, uh, I will start about uh, philosophical argument. We believe the woman cannot be harmed just because of their gender. As human being, women also need a recognition for their feminine existence. We can challenge the stereotypical view that can marginalize women's role in terms of their domestic function, not in the broader context of public life. Although the system and direction of government political policy toward women issue are increasing gender responsive, the position of women in the context of political power is still vulnerable to various forms of political manipulation. It is often used as a tool of political legitimacy. That is a uh, basic or uh, based on a philosophical argument. Jadi kita meyakini bahwa perempuan itu tidak bisa dirugikan hanya karena jenis kelaminnya. Itu yang terpenting. Karena dia juga sebagai manusia yang punya keinginan untuk diakui eksistensinya. Oke, okay, next. Women's political participation 
Community political participation, especially women, is one form of actualization of the democracy process. Political participation is the activity of person of group of people to participate actively in political life, among others, by causing state leaders and an active role directly or indirectly to influence public policy. Thus, political participation is closely related to political awareness because the more aware they are being governed. People demand to be given the right to voice in government administration. Jadi partisipasi kaum partisipasi politik kaum perempuan itu uh, diakui diberi ruang yang sangat luas saat ini. Dan saya kira Aceh adalah contoh atau daerah yang paling baik e, memberikan contoh atas partisipasi politik kaum perempuan ini. Next, political participation itu ada banyak ya, e, voting, political discussion, campaign, forming or join an interest group. Individual communication with political official, petition submission, demonstration, strike, boycott. Itu adalah contoh-contoh bagaimana saluran partisipasi politik yang bisa diikuti oleh siapa saja. Jadi misalnya forming or join an interest group. Tadi Mbak Katrina menyebutkan uh, bahwa di Aceh itu ada Inong Bale, kalau tidak salah. Tadi. Nah itu adalah salah satu contoh bagaimana partisipasi politik kaum perempuan yang membentuk atau bergabung dengan kelompok kepentingan. Nah, jadi eh, tren besarnya adalah bagaimana kemudian eh, partisipasi politik kaum perempuan ke depan ini oleh terutama perempuan-perempuan Aceh. Nah, ini pertanyaan besar yang harus kita jawab pada kesempatan kali ini. Next, eh, politik and achievement. Women's participation in politics can be start from small thing, the encouraged government program, such as family welfare empowerment. Uh, kalau kita bilang seperti PKK, kemudian ada integrated healthcare center atau posyandu, kemudian family planning and other activities that move women toward common interest. Jadi selain partisipasi politik bagi kaum perempuan ada juga saluran-saluran di mana kaum perempuan itu bisa punya eksistensi di mana dia bisa uh, mengartikulasikan pesan-pesan keperempuanannya pesan-pesan kemanusiaannya lewat kegiatan-kegiatan yang ada di tingkat grassroot uh, sosial kemasyarakatan A woman can achieve a position if she can improve result better than before and has good work performance to be recognized for her leadership by anyone. Jadi dengan demikian partisipasi politik itu bisa sampai ke puncak di mana perempuan itu diakui kepemimpinnya oleh siapapun. Nah itu ditunjukkan oleh perempuan-perempuan Aceh masa lalu dan e, mungkin juga e, pasca kemerdekaan. Nah tinggal bagaimana kemudian mengemas e, format-format seperti itu untuk kedepannya. Next, woman in parliament. Ini uh, historical perspective, member of professional uh, professional DPR from uh, 1970 to 1970, uh, maaf, uh, dari tahun 1950 sampai tahun 1955, uh, berhasil mengakomodasi 9 kursi atau 3,8 persen, 3,8 persen, dari 236 kursi di oh. legislatif pada saat itu. Kemudian naik pada tahun uh, berikutnya, uh, 55 sampai dengan tahun 60, 6,3 persen di legislatif. Kemudian 
kalau kita lihat pada tahun 1997 atau 1977 itu juga sampai ke angka 6,3 persen atau 29 kursi di parlemen. Nah ini menunjukkan bahwa uh, ada kekuatan uh, dari kelompok kaum perempuan untuk bisa ikut mempengaruhi jalannya kebijakan politik di Indonesia. Uh, itu belum sampai pada pengakuan kuota atau dengan affirmative action uh, 30% di parlemen. Laporan dari uh, Interparliamentary Union menyebutkan bahwa uh, up and down, ya, kenaikan-kenaikan uh, posisi perempuan di uh, parlemen. Kita melihat sampai dengan tahun 2009 uh, pemilu tahun 2009 uh, ada 18,6 persen atau setara dengan 100 empat kursi diduduki oleh perempuan dari total jumlah anggota parlemen itu 560. Jadi kenaikannya cukup signifikan dari tahun 2004 pasca reformasi. Di mana start awal reformasi itu perempuan hanya mendapat 40 kursi dari total 500 anggota parlemen. Mungkin sekarang lebih banyak data yang bisa kita lihat. Next, uh, itu di uh, parlemen. So, bagaimana uh, in the executive agency? Di executive agency, kita juga melihat bahwa dari total kepala desa, ada uh, 3,9% satu persen perempuan ini data BPS tahun 2010 jadi begitu banyak desa yang ada di Indonesia perempuan menduduki kepala desa 3,91 persen kemudian pada akhir tahun 2090 oh maaf pada akhir tahun 2009 dari 33 gubernur terpilih Uh, ada satu perempuan uh, yang menjabat sebagai gubernur. Kemudian 440 jabatan bupati atau wali kota uh, dari total tersebut hanya 2,27 persen yang dijabat oleh perempuan untuk uh, bupati atau wali kota. Jenjang karir perempuan sebagai PNS atau ASN juga terlihat mentok di eselon 2 karena 91,3 persen pemangku jabatan eselon 1 dipegang oleh laki-laki padahal di eselon 2 terdapat 45 persen perempuan dan 55 persen laki-laki ini juga dari uh, data badan kebegawaian nasional tahun 2009 uh, jarang sekali uh, PNS itu sampai menjabat ke eselon 1 Ini untuk uh, executive agency. Kalau tadi kita uh, berbicara di parlemen, uh, partisipasi politik kaum perempuan, sekarang di uh, badan eksekutif atau di kepemerintahan. Kemudian woman in judiciary. For the judiciary, the representation of woman in the Supreme Court is also minimal. Jadi uh, di pengadilan atau di lembaga kehakiman, juga sangat minimal kaum perempuan berkipa. Data tahun 2010 menyebutkan bahwa eh, tidak ada perempuan yang duduk sebagai hakim agung, yang ada hanya eh, duduk di tingkat eselon 2 Mahkamah Agung, yakni 15,8 persen. Rasio gender sebagai hakim juga masih timpang, di mana 75 persen hakim di peradilan sipil adalah laki-laki dan 25, 24% itu perempuan. Nah, jadi baik itu di sektor parlemen, kemudian uh, eksekutif agensi, dan di uh, 
institusi kehakiman atau pengadilan eh, saat ini eh, partisipasi kaum perempuan itu sangat eh, minim. Ini menjadi catatan penting bagi kita bagaimana kemudian eh, kiprah-kiprah di tiga sektor itu harus eh, betul-betul eh, kita dorong agar eh, eksistensi kaum perempuan itu bisa eh, naik. Ini adalah Women's Political Channel. Kalau kita melihat berdasarkan dari Undang-Undang tahun 1945, ada BPK, ada uh, Lembaga Kepresidenan, ada DPR, ada MPR, ada DPD, ada Mahkamah Agung, ada Mahkamah Konstitusi, dan ada Komisi Yudisial. Jadi ada banyak uh, saluran politik uh, perempuan untuk bisa eksis menyuarakan kepentingan politiknya, menyuarakan kepentingan uh, uh, sosialnya. Tetapi kita menghadapi hambatan yakni uh, kultur atau budaya politik patriarki. Dalam kekuasaan berstruktur patriarkis, politik bukan cuma refleksi dari interest kekuasaan dan uang, tetapi juga seks. Nah, banyak sekali kita lihat berita-berita transaksi seks dan transaksi keuangan dalam struktur politik patriarki. Nah, ini sebenarnya kemerosotan moral politik ya, di level elit yang kemudian harus kita rubah, harus kita lawan agar bisa membangun peradaban atau membangun bangsa ini lewat jalur politik itu menjadi baik. Nah, maka partisipasi kaum perempuan itu saya kira bisa uh, untuk uh, menghalau, menghadang uh, budaya politik patriarki ini. Uh, asal jangan uh, ikut juga di dalam transaksi politik yang terjadi. Nah, ini menjadi penting PR bagi kita juga bagaimana kaum perempuan bisa uh, punya posisi tawar di dalam Uh, patriarchal political culture uh, terakhir yang bisa saya uh, sampaikan ini adalah tentang uh, main pointnya bagaimana uh, woman political channel that can be used from parliament executive agency until justice institution Ini kita bisa masuk ke semua sektor untuk merubah cara pandang, merubah budaya, merubah uh, aktivitas yang uh, membawa pesan-pesan kemanusiaan lewat uh, kaum perempuan. Saya kira ini uh, penting bagi kita untuk ketren ke depan, uh, sehingga perempuan tidak lagi uh, tunduk oleh budaya patriarki. Dan PR bagi kita ke depan ini adalah the fundamental challenges of the women's movement ahead. Yang pertama adalah tentang uh, globalisasi neoliberal yang telah melahirkan kekuatan ekonomi dunia yang berpusat di negara-negara maju yang diikuti restrukturisasi ekonomi di negara-negara miskin dan sedang berkembang. Nah, situasi ini telah menciptakan kemiskinan yang makin akut dan kompleks. Nah, bagaimana kemudian eh, jangan sampai perempuan itu menjadi objek dari komunitas ekonomi, menjadi eh, apa namanya problem baru bagi kaum perempuan. Misalnya kekerasan terhadap eh, asisten rumah tangga, kemudian maraknya PSK, kemudian jual-beli buruh migran, dan uh, sektor-sektor uh, informal di mana perempuan itu digaji sangat rendah. Nah ini uh, akibat dari uh, globalisasi, di mana kemudian uh, orang bisa saja menjadi komunitas. Ini menjadi uh, PR bagi kita pertama untuk bisa melihat bahwa jangan sampai perempuan itu masuk terperangkap terjerembab dengan eh, kekuatan ekonomi global di mana bisa jadi perempuan menjadi objek atau komunitas ekonomi. Nah kita harus hati-hati terhadap itu. 
Kemudian uh, the, the second one adalah state political autoritarianisme. Ya. Yeah. Di mana uh, kita yeah. tahu bahwa uh, kontrol like negara it. atas warga negara okay. yang berlebih-lebihan terutama terhadap kaum perempuan telah berakibat pada hadirnya lembaga kebijakan negara berbagai kebijakan negara yang bias hak asasi manusia bias gender uh, misalnya undang-undang uh, anti porno aksi undang-undang anti pornografi dan perda-perda di berbagai daerah yang bias terhadap penafsiran sempit atas agama tertentu dan kemudian Uh, menyebabkan kerugian uh, terhadap uh, perempuan dan terutama tubuhnya. Nah ini juga PR bersama kita bagaimana uh, otoritarianisme yang dilakukan oleh negara terhadap warganya. Kemudian yang ketiga, tantangan fundamental kita adalah uh, fundamental atau uh, kebijakan negara yang uh, tidak pro terhadap uh, apa kaum perempuan. Banyak sekali anggaran-anggaran negara itu diprioritaskan untuk pembangunan fisik. Ya, tetapi kemudian uh, untuk uh, masyarakat terutama kaum perempuan itu tidak mendapat akses terhadap uh, keuangan negara. Nah ini yang terjadi adalah kemudian uh, perempuan menjadi lemah uh, untuk dapat mengakses pendidikan, untuk mendapat akses kesehatan, untuk mendapat akses pekerjaan, dan lain sebagainya. Nah ini uh, kita juga harus bisa mengontrol uh, berapa persen sah, berapa persen sih keuangan negara itu mengalir kepada kepentingan kaum perempuan. Ini uh, juga tantangan fundamental kita. Berikutnya yang keempat adalah uh, fundamentalisme agama. Ya, di mana gerakan-gerakan agama yang disinyalir melakukan perlawanan terhadap hegemoni barat dan didominasi kekuatan kapitalisme yang berpijak pada sikap dan aksi yang radikal, sempit dan sepihak, telah menimbulkan ekses baru hadirnya rantai kekerasan dan penindasan bagi perempuan. Perempuan dilibatkan untuk gerakan-gerakan fundamental, gerakan-gerakan yang mengarah kepada radikalisme, pengeboman, dan lain sebagainya. Itu membawa PR juga yang sangat berat bagi kita karena kita adalah masyarakat beragama. Jadi uh, religious fundamentalism itu menjadi tantangan ke depan kita bagaimana kemudian uh, pandangan-pandangan miring terhadap kaum perempuan uh, menyampingkan, uh, menutup akses kaum perempuan untuk bisa uh, berkiprah di dunia politik, ekonomi, sosial, dan lain sebagainya. Kemudian uh, tantangan fundamental berikutnya adalah liberalisasi politik yang terjadi sejak era reformasi tidak otomatis diikuti oleh kesiapan lembaga pendidikan dan rekrutmen politik, terutama partai politik untuk secara serius dan berkelanjutan untuk membuka kesempatan partisipasi perempuan dalam politik, terutama untuk menempatkan perempuan dalam posisi dan tanggung jawab organisatoris yang sangat signifikan untuk kemajuan bagi dirinya dan bagi kaumnya. Jadi liberalisasi politik yang notabene eh, banyak terjadi eh, politik transaksional itu kadang menempatkan perempuan eh, pada eh, tempat-tempat yang tidak strategis di jabatan-jabatan politik. Hanya beberapa partai yang secara serius untuk memenuhi kuota 30 persennya. Itu pun kadang-kadang tidak diimbangi oleh kos politik yang memadai bagi kaum perempuan, sehingga keterpilihan kaum perempuan itu juga akhirnya tidak tercapai secara maksimal. Dan kemudian berikutnya yang keenam adalah uh, gerakan perempuan dengan demikian ditantang untuk mampu mendobrak lobby-lobby politik laki-laki yang elitis 
dan budaya politik partai yang cenderung sentralistis dan sangat patriarki, serta merubah politik dan pola pikir jajaran elit partai agar memberikan ruang dan peluang yang lebih besar pada kader-kader politik kaum perempuan. Nah ini eh, bagaimana gerakan kaum perempuan baik eh, di dalam parlemen maupun di luar parlemen, eh, di jalur eh, politik untuk bisa menyuarakan ini agar eh, perempuan bisa terwakili eh, di dalam eh, rekrutmen-rekrutmen eh, politik eh, di masa depan. Dan yang terakhir adalah eh, meskipun kuota 30 persen itu sangat strategis, namun regulasi tersebut hanya salah satu elemen utama dalam upaya memperkuat representasi politik perempuan. Sehingga eh, ke depan eh, kita harus bisa eh, bekerja sama, bergandengan tangan untuk eh, memenuhi kuota 30 persen tersebut agar eh, perempuan mampu memperluas basis konstituennya. Dan dengan itu, perempuan bisa menyuarakan kepentingan-kepentingan kaumnya dan juga bisa merubah eh, apa, politik kebangsaan kita ke depan. Saya kira itu eh, tantangan fundamental kita ke depan dalam aspek-aspek eh, sosial politik. Uh, Meli, I think enough uh, for my uh, presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much Thank for the This is very uh, incredible. Uh, you talk a lot about women's in politics, particularly in terms of uh, politics in Indonesia. You start by giving us uh, the argument that actually women cannot be disadvantaged just because of her sex. They should be given opportunities, more opportunities to participate more because their participation means a lot for the development of nation. And also, um, you mentioned that actually Aceh could become a good example of women participation, where participations are varied, can be understood in many aspects, not only in terms of participation in general election. Um, uh, Dr. Beni also gives us uh, the presentations about um, women's participation in three areas in uh, legislative, in executive, and judiciary. And still, in, in terms of executive, we can see that very rarely women occupied high positions, unfortunately. And in legislative, even though there is 30% quotas for women, um, Actually, it's still far below 30%. And in judiciary, um, the research shows that no women are sitting as Supreme Court justice, and the gender ratio as judges is still unequal. And he also highlights uh, several problems that uh, uh, contribute to these uh, conditions such as uh, patriarchal political culture that is still exist um, in society. And women also should have courage to confront this patriarchal political culture in order to reverse these conditions. And several challenges also being highlighted by uh, Dr. Beni, such as the poverty that actually leads to the condition where women become economic commodity, and also the problem of state political authoritarianism, which leads to gender bias policies produced, and state policies that are actually not for women's interests, and also uh, several conditions like religious fundamentalism, which develops nowadays, which put women um, as an object to, to perform radicalism. And also we need to uh, work together, all societies need to work together in order to um, change uh, this condition. So thank you so much for this very uh, extensive uh, presentation, sir. So um, it's the end of the presentation session. Uh, I will try to open for the question and answer uh, session now. For those who have questions, 
just feel free to um, say your name and then just post your questions. Is there anyone? Is there anyone? I have questions specifically um, to um, German, Germany, uh, and it, it is addressed to Professor uh, Thomas Schmidt. And I've got to ask questions. What are the reasons that cause PSU, FDP, and RFK reject the voluntary self commitment to gender uh, parity? Is it, is it uh, something related to um, eligibility, and how is the uh, the proponents uh, take on this? You want me to add immediately? No. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for that interesting question. Um, the main reason is uh, not so different from, from what we have heard about Indonesia. It's a uh, cultural issues. And in particular, in the political parties, there are a lot of career risks. That means people who are just interested to promote their career. And they are fighting to get the positions in the party lists. So that the women uh, in particular in those parties which are more conservative or more religious, they are simply not so successful. It's changing very quickly, but there are influential groups of men who would not accept so many women besides them in the Christian Democratic Party and then also the, uh, the right-wing uh, party. There's also a liberal party, uh, um, which has a totally different approach. This liberal party thinks there should not be any constraint uh, by the law. So they, they do not uh, offend the idea that there should be more, more women in the, in the parliament, but they do not accept uh, the idea that the state is dictating rules to the parties how to do that. But this is only the small liberal party. The main reason is still conservative, biased cultural thinking. Thank you so much. Is there any questions? Other questions? Um, can I can I ask a question to you, um, Dr. Katrina Liku too? Um, I would like to um, uh, hear from you that uh, did you go uh, that far to trace the um, the original. Uh, a legacy of um, uh, uh, woman marginality in uh, throughout Aceh's history that has been uh, transmitted throughout um, uh, these whole uh, periods of Aceh history, and because I think um, to deduce something uh, based on uh, fragments of conflict phenomena um, is it, not would not uh, completely represent uh, uh, this um, legacy of men's uh, of the society's mindset. And I want to hear from you uh, problematizing uh, 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 this aspect. Thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, when I did my, my interviews, and I, I've been in Arche maybe about four or five times since 2005. Um, and whenever I interview someone about the role of women in Archinese society, the first thing they do is they tell me the history of Arche. 
and a very rich and proud history of strong women's leadership throughout the province. Um, and so I know a little bit about it from hearing stories and also from my own reading, but I think it's very much forefront in people's minds when they think about the role of women. So in some ways, um, I found it a very complex story because on the one hand, there is a, a strong um, tradition of women's informal leadership within the community. So we can see that in the family, um, but also in, in the broader community group. But um, there's also what I've seen since 2005, um, a lack of women's formal leadership in, in areas where political decisions are being made, where it's being decided how resources will be distributed, what kind of policy priorities the community will have and the ways in which it interprets um, Sharia. And so there is a strong tradition of, of, of women's participation and that was also throughout the conflict period, uh, but that hasn't translated into that formal leadership um, where they've been able to have a strong influence over decision making. Um, at least that's what I found in, in talking to people, but I'd be happy to hear other people's thoughts about that as well. Thank you, Dr. Caprina. Uh, but do, do you offer any um, uh, role model or example from the uh, countries that have been affected by conflicts that have successfully um, positioned women and men in this whole uh, series of uh, peace agreement process that could be uh, a role model for us today? And yes. Yeah, thank you for the question. Sorry, I, I missed that. Um, one of the um, uh, the gold standard agreements more recently is uh, the 2016 or 2017 Colombian peace agreement between the Colombian government and the, the FARC, uh, the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia. So this was an agreement that had very strong participation of women on both sides of the agreement. There were 40% women on the FARC side and about the same on the government side. And there were um, international mediators um, were 50-50 in terms of men and women. Uh, and this peace agreement had something like 400 provisions in it that dealt with women's issues to do with women after the conflict. So everything from women's human rights to women's empowerment to women's position and role in government. Um, and so this has been a good example of the inclusion of women's issues and women in a peace agreement. The Liberian peace agreement is also a good example of uh, women's inclusion. Um, unfortunately, Afghanistan is not an example. Um, so sometimes when we think we're making progress globally um, and we're seeing good, um, good participation from women, then something like the Afghan agreement will come and we see it moving backwards. Um, the Philippines agreement, the Bank Samoro agreement, is also an example where there was strong women's participation as negotiators. Um, but I think it's one thing to say it's important to have women participate in negotiating the peace agreements, and it's important to have issues uh, um, do, to do with women in the peace agreement, so to have gender provisions in that peace agreement, but it's also another thing to implement those agreements. Um, and I think we see that all over the world. And I think um, our colleagues have talked about that with the 30% um, rule in Indonesia as well. We've got the agreement, but it's not necessarily being well implemented. Um, and we see that with peace agreements as well. So we found about 40% of the gender provisions in peace agreements actually get implemented. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for the question by Shukri Rizki and response has been given by uh, Katrina Liku. And there is a question as well coming from Anissa in chat room. Please, Ms. Melly, help to help me to deliver this question. The, con the quantity of um, the quantity of policies that support women are more important for a country like Indonesia. 
um, actually, I, I kind of get the what question is because for me, it's like a statement. Could Anisa Putri uh, help me to uh, deliver the question, probably? Kelly, I think the question might be um, how, how can a country like Indonesia introduce policies that support uh, women's participation in parliament? Yeah, I think yeah, 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 yeah. that's the question. Is there any invited speakers who want to address this question? How a country like Indonesia could promote the policies which could be uh, which could be promoting general uh, gender equality in politics? Well, I think in theory Indonesia could take the same efforts as they are done in, in, in Europe, for example, mandatory gender quotas. If you really introduce mandatory gender quotas in the zipping system. That means on the electoral list, there must be one man, one woman, one man, one woman, or uh, in majority vote, there must be a minimum number, uh, an equal number of female candidates to the, the male candidates. This would indeed change a lot. However, since this is a distortion of a free political uh, democratic process, this would need a specific constitutional basis. This is the quintessence of the discussion in Europe. And in France, they have such a basis. However, such a base needs a constitutional amendment. And in Indonesia, it is not very easy to make a constitutional amendment with this very complicated proceedings. So uh, I think that theoretically, this is possible, but in practice, that may, may be difficult. Anyway, I think that, uh, that uh, an important aspect would also be to raise awareness of women, to be more politically active, also more active in NGOs, uh, more active in political parties, not to be intimidated by male presence or male criticism in the internet. <laughs> This is also one aspect which, one approach which might already help a little bit. Also, I think it's interesting uh, to, to uh, make a reform of political party funding, private funding tax advantages, public funding, uh, where the, the law could change a system where gender parity is... Um, taken into consideration as one aspect, for example, of public fu party funding of tax advantages and so on. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you so much for the response. Probably is there any thoughts from uh, Dr. Beni or Dr. Misbah Doha? and how to actually promote uh, the policies which are uh, promoting gender equality for uh, Indonesia. Uh, yeah, I, I'll try to uh, support the answer, Mbak Meli. Yeah. Uh, uh, considering to the culture and the uh, accommodation of regulation and culture, I think, uh, the quota of 30% is uh, very strategic for uh, the country like Indonesia. It is impossible to uh, stay the quota till 40%, for example, like in the countries of Scandinavian, for example, because uh, uh, the, the gender uh, parties is still uh, like uh, today's in our daily life. So if uh, we uh, succeed to get the quota of 30%, I think uh, there, there will be a change in our political structure. And also this is based on the uh, social context because the rep rep representative of a political party is come from uh, society members. So the, uh, the most important here is the uh, the process of uh, political education in the basic of our society entities. Uh, and uh, once again, I, I, 
I stated that it is not a short time to get the 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 achievement the achievement because the, this is related to our mind how can we achieve the that quota if uh, there are so many uh, obstacles in our society um, how uh, we uh, grow our role in 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 one household for example it is that is still bias uh, so many burden on women, how can they uh, take a, a political role fully? That is important. So, that is, uh, so the point here is the process of political education. So we don't, uh, we, we don't uh, want to force uh, the number, but we must accommodate the concept of our gender itself. That is in my view, by Melly. Thank you so much, Ms. Bah. Uh, is there any additional information, probably from uh, Mr. Benny? Okay. Uh, we must uh, to campaign for the power of women to reach the. Uh, 30% quota, especially political parties, to seriously and continuously open up opportunities for women participation in politics. Uh, saya kira kita harus bisa mendorong uh, kaum perempuan untuk mencapai uh, 30% kuota itu dan mendorong partai politik untuk secara serius membuka uh, kesempatan bagi kaum perempuan agar bisa mencapai uh, lebih. Jadi affirmative action itu tidak hanya semata-mata berkah, tetapi harus diperjuangkan betul agar bisa uh, ke depannya nanti bisa equal, ya, sehingga uh, peran perempuan itu bisa lebih uh, kuat, uh, terutama di parlemen. Saya kira itu. Oke, okay, thank you so much for all uh, the responses from the invited speakers. And if you have still questions, just feel free to uh, up your questions here. But I have my own question, <laughs> I think I want to post it as well. Uh, do you think that we also have like uh, the problem in women themselves, I mean, um, about their, how to say, confidence uh, to participate in politics probably is there is that becomes the issue as well that probably hampers them from joining or participating in politics i mean is there any like uh, the challenge from women themselves not from society uh, because of the cultural or patriarchal culture that um, exists in the middle of society, but probably is there the challenge coming from women themselves, probably the lack of confidence themselves, even though there is no formal barriers that could yeah. hamper them, but actually probably because of them. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I can give a comment on that from the perspective of the European experiences. It has taken a long time, since the 1950s, men and women are equal legally. So there is no subordination of the wife to the husband anymore, and all these legal barriers have been eliminated. But only in the 90s did, did women in Europe start to become active, politically active on a large scale. Before, that were more or less an uh, exception. And... Uh, there are also reasons in the women themselves. For example, if a woman thinks that she is responsible for the household. We have seen in Europe, the man will not care for the household. So, so his wife can be politically active, but then she must be politically active and do the household. And the man will be lazy sitting at home. These aspects are very important. Also, often women think that they are responsible, um, mainly is responsible for the education of the children. So they do not want to neglect the education of the children. 
That's why we have made the experience in Europe that for all kinds of gender parity, also in professional life, it is very important to have a strong social infrastructure like daycare centers, kindergartens, uh, 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 housemates, which can help and so on. So that the, the woman can really be active without having the idea that she is neglecting other duties. In the present generation, the younger generation, this factor is not so strong anymore because, for example, usually now in the young generation, um, both spouses, wife and husband, are sharing the work in the family and in the household. But already 20, 30 years ago, this was a quite strong factor. So the first aspect would be that the woman needs to have in mind there is no reason why a woman should be less politically active than a man. And if she does not have enough time, then her husband must support her. For example, in Europe, a woman who is politically active can expect that maybe her husband even will cut his job, will finish his job and take care of the children. I've done that for my wife, uh, which was, was professionally active in the past. So you need to have this consciousness, but not only in the woman, you need to have that in the man too, because the husband must support. If the husband does not support the political activities of the wife, it will be difficult. So we, we see that the factor is then in the woman that she still thinks that she is neglecting her duties. Why the other way around, the husband, if he is act politically active, he would never think like that. And this is still going on. So this is the uh, deeper cultural background where awareness in the mind of the woman has to, to develop. And that takes some time. I'm sorry, but in Europe, it took more or less 50 years. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much you for the, uh, uh, you say the portrait of the uh, women's roles in uh, European countries. And probably is there any additional information from other invited speakers? Okay, uh, may I add uh, some comment by Melly? Yeah, sure. To, yeah. Yeah, uh, I have another uh, research related to uh, woman obstacle in politics. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I have uh, entitled the research as Queen Bee Phenomena. Yeah, uh, there, is a, uh, inter there is an interesting phenomenon uh, actually uh, among women. Okay, the, uh, the big, uh, the big, What's it? The big trap is culture, actually. Uh, the, uh, the culture and uh, map the woman as the subordinate. On the time, women want to enhance their participation. The, uh, they uh, themselves have a psychological and cultural obstacle, of course. But not only that, uh, but Melly. Uh, the other woman also see the woman who take part in the political area is uh, as if a minor, minor role. So uh, their their uh, question is uh, what are they uh, what are they doing in the political sphere? All time they do their work in their office uh, to do anything. So this is the question. Then this is not uh, common woman people. Common people. This is activists, and the, and the woman also try to uh, boost the information about the minor side of the other woman. And if we dig uh, this information, it is based on the concept of woman is not fit in the public area. So uh, that is the problem, but mainly. So uh, culture, actually, they trap the, the concept, but it uh, impacted in the woman. Uh, uh, the, and also, women are more 
<laughs> okay, uh, that, that, that is uh, my additional uh, uh, comment about, about the obstacle of women to involve in the political area. Thank you, Mbak Meli. It's very interesting. Thank you so much, Bumisma. And also, I would like to say thanks to Katrina Liku because yeah, she has to leave now for picking up her son. Thank you so much for your presentation and your thoughts. Um, we are anticipating uh, for your participations again in the future um, events. Yeah. See you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nelly. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Hope to see you again. To see you again. <laughs> If uh, you have still questions about women, about everything, you can just pose your questions here. Feel free to do so. Or if you are not confident to say it directly, just mention it in chat room. It's still fine. It seems someone raised his hand, but Mary. Or really? Or red me? Does it red me? Do you have a question, Mr. Red me or Miss Red me? <laughs> yeah, and those who have also other questions uh, to ask to. Professor Dr. Thomas Smith, you can just contact him at tschmit1 at gwdg.de. I think if you guys um, don't have any questions anymore, I think uh, I will just close this session. I would like to say thanks to all invited speakers who have very uh, it's extensive thoughts in regards to the theme that we offer, which is enhancing women's role in social and political life, new developments and trends. We hope that we can work together in order to push, encourage women participations in political aspects, in social aspects, in economic aspects, in other aspects of life. So we agree, all of us agree that actually cultural problems are still there and of course, it takes some time to change it, to uh, renew our, our talks about women's participation, about, about women's roles. Women should not um, hamper from joining political or public spheres, even though they are also playing a very important role in domestic or in uh, family environment, they should be given opportunities to also play some roles in the decision-making process and any other aspects of life. So thank you so much for inviting speakers and for all participants who have already joined us from the first session until now, for the participations who's coming in this room and also for the participations joining in Zoom meeting as well. Uh, at the end, um, uh, I'm Heli Masni, who conducted the moderator for today's uh, plenary session. Uh, would say, Wabilahi Taufik Walidaya. Assalamualaikum warahmatullah wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullah wabarakatuh. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you.